It's a delight to be with you this evening, and thank you for listening in. I want to begin by reading a text of scripture, 2 Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he or she has been cleansed from her past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. There are a number of people I wish to thank um, as I begin. Uh, so thankful, first of all, for my, my wife, Tammy, for her, all her support emotionally and in every way. Um, during the time of writing a book, it obviously has its ups and downs, and uh, pastoral ethics is no exception. And uh, so I'm grateful so much to Tammy and the wider family also. I want to, want to thank my ed editor, Elliot Ritzema, who is, uh, was present in the evening of the book launch. Um, he was an excellent editor, and also the acquisition ed editor, Jesse Myers. And uh, in addition to that, um, Abigail Stalker uh, was also present, and she did the cover of the book. It's absolutely beautiful. I'm so grateful. Uh, for her work as well. Grateful also for the generosity of the Chi family. Jimmy is here, was here also this evening, and uh, grateful for uh, their kindness and friendship. I'm also grateful to the board of Regent College and uh, our administrators, our President Jeff and uh, our Dean Paul for their ongoing um, work enabling us to have things like sabbaticals, which are so important for book writing. Um, the book is actually dedicated to two friends who are both medical doctors who've been friends for a long time. The first one is Ivan Stewart, who is my medical doctor and uh, friend from Kingston, Ontario, and uh, also um, Lawrence Perold, who has been my doctor and friend also here in uh, White Rock, BC. Uh, grateful for their friendship and encouragement and um, so here we are. Um, the topic for tonight is the person of the pastor. I'm not going to deal with all of the ethical issues that a pastor faces, but most of them uh, are anticipated, hopefully, in the book. I want to speak about the person uh, of the pastor, keys to, resilient, to resilience in ministry. Partly what prompted the writing of this book is the steady steam of, stream of pastors leaving their vocation with accompanying scandal uh, some of the time. One startling statistic, statistic is that only 15% of pastors will actually retire um, as pastors. The reasons for this lack of longevity in the pastorate, uh, pastorate are many. Mental health issues, sexual malfeasance. Um, domineering leadership styles or weak leadership styles, uh, financial deprivation, the demands of the people they lead, the low spiritual state and biblical illiteracy and in indiscriminately encultured state of the church at times, um, perhaps lack of uh, work-life balance, um, a whole list of things. Um, I really do not stand in judgment on anybody. I should have been a statistic myself, and I'm often thankful uh, for the prayers of my parents and um, 
my wife Tammy and my wife Sharon in the past. Uh, I lost my wife Sharon to cancer a um, number of years ago, 15 years ago, and uh, she was such an incredible prayer warrior as well. The fact that I survived 20 years in the pastorate and 18 years now at Regent is a testimony to sheer grace. Um, I have lived with a pretty poor sense of self, um, much higher sense of self-hatred than of any temptation to self-love. Self-hatred is not a Christian virtue, by the way. Um, I had very loving parents, uh, but maybe as is typical of the culture that I come from, a Scottish culture, uh, they were not highly affirming or expressive of love in verbal ways. Um, they expressed their love in, in other ways. Um, I also went to boarding school at the age of six um, in Zambia, uh, where a sense of self uh, was not uh, particularly uh, prominent, perhaps um, in some ways minimized uh, for the sake of the gospel as, uh, as certain missionaries understood it in that time. I also went to military, sky, military type uh, uh, schools in, in Rhodesia and now Zimbabwe that were somewhat military in their style of, of discipline. It was not uncommon to be receive a beating with a, a bamboo cane. Uh, in addition to that, I had many, many moves in my childhood. Uh, if I could list the places where I've lived and countries, I've lived in um, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Scotland on a number of occasions, England and Newcastle upon Tyne. I've lived in various cities of, of uh, uh, in Canada as well, and all of that tend not um, to produce uh, a great sense of self. And as, as a result of that, I think um, I've had to deal in my life with things like drivenness, um, highly driven, highly driven, um, fueled by some of that pain and anger perhaps, uh, selfish ambition, relational distance, uh, those things have characterized me. That's why I say I should have been a statistic. Um, I've been greatly helped by a number of people in my life to overcome those things, and particularly Judith McBride is my psychiatrist to help me deal with um, clinical depression. Um, but grace has come also through both what one might call communal or ecclesial disciplines of the church, the Lord's Supper, the hearing of the word of God, all of those things have, have helped to heal. Um, and uh, also God has given me some gracious encounters with himself. I'll never forget after I uh, finished my uh, second PhD at St. Andrews and I had a week to spare and I went down uh, to Edinburgh to see a cricket match uh, and then went down to Gala Shields to watch a rugby match which was the last match of two great heroes of Scottish rugby, Gary Armstrong and Dottie Weir. Um, and I sat there in the stands. It's, it's a beautiful area, the borders. Um, and I'm standing there thinking to myself, you know, I really love Scotland. I think I'm going to go back to, to Sharon um, and tell her that we need to come back to Scotland because this is where I feel most at home. And I could almost hear her words in my head right away. Uh, she would have said, you're going back on your own son. Um, because she loved Canada, and there's no way she was coming back to Scotland. And then I, I sort of put my hands up almost in despair, and I said, well, where is my home? And, and I'm, I've, had, I've had this happen very rarely in my life, but God spoke to me very powerfully. And in that very moment, he said, uh, he said to me, Ross, I am your home. The triune God of grace is my home. And I actually began to shed a tear as I felt the, the, uh, the reality of that, the strange moment, standing with a whole bunch of rugby fans, uh, they were cheering a game. Um, I was actually experiencing the love of God in a very powerful way. It's one of those remarkable things that God has done to help heal me and uh, to enable me to maintain um, faithfulness in the pastorate um, and with, a, with a, whole, a whole lot of other factors too. I'm so grateful, but I certainly don't stand in judgment on anybody. Um, there are all kinds of prescriptions as to why it is that pastors are falling um, and at the core, my own personal belief, and this is actually relevant for all Christians, not just pastors, is the matter of personhood and character in that order. Another way of saying is this, this is that the key issue is knowledge of the self in the context of the knowledge of God, or 
double knowledge, as John Calvin called it. This includes knowledge of our emotions, our affections, that is emotional intelligence. It includes proper knowledge of our beings as sexual beings, understanding that the given sexness of our human persons, whether single or married, is crucial to who we are as persons made in the image of God, and that its primary purpose is to take us out of ourselves towards the human other in community and out of ourselves towards God in contemplation. A further area of self-knowledge, I think, is also with respect to the fact that we are missional people in light of the missional God. Now, the expectation might be that to address all of these issues, I should speak about character. I want to try to convince you in this talk that although character is vital, a larger category within theological anthropology is personhood, and that addressing character or virtue outside of the context of persons and participation of our persons with the triune God and then with each other leads actually to self-absorption and futility. I'm arguing, in other words, that identity trumps character. Personhood is the realm within which dependent relationality with Christ by the Spirit emerges. And character is a byproduct of that. Character and virtue are a product of participation in the life of God. I believe evangelicals are often guilty of not recognizing the importance of being in our theology and ethics. Epistemology, or how we know, yes, somewhat. Doing, yes, a lot. But ontology, or being, very little. The ground of knowing and doing is actually our being. Specifically, our being in Christ. And our failure to see this leads to ethical approaches that I think are legal rather than evangelical. By evangelical, I, word, I mean of the gospel. They are legal rather than evangelical. They are anthropocentric rather than theocentric. And so the theological ethic or meta-ethic on which this book um, is founded is a Trinitarian one. That is the being of God and our being in him. It is a gospel or evangelical ethic. That is... Ethics must be grounded in our relationship with the triune God, who is already for us. He is the God who is for humanity, as evidenced by the giving of his Son and the sending of his Spirit. A God who, before he gives any of the Ten Commandments, actually first says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt. In other words, these commandments are get-tos, not have-tos. And they lead into a life of shalom and flourishing, human flourishing. With Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I argue that ethics done outside of the ethos of covenant relationship with God becomes idolatry and contrary to the gospel. But when fulfilled within the life of God, ethics becomes part of the gospel. I argue that this broad ethic of Trinitarian being and our being in the Trinity by participation transcends the other major ethical systems, which are usually spoken of as deontological ethics, which is the ethics of rules, utilitarian ethics, the ethics of means and ends, or even virtue ethics, ethics of character. One reason I think virtue ethics is subsumed under Trinitarian ethics is that persons in relation with God is, uh, and participating in the life of God um, is the key to the de development of their character and their virtue. So if I can sum up what it means um, to be uh, engaged in Trinitarian ethics, um, it is as follows. So here we have a pastor who's in danger of, uh, in his zeal for the work of God um, perhaps failing to understand the work of God in his life. Uh, so uh, here, here we may, uh, um, this is actually a summation of the book. Um, first of all, as those in covenant relationship with God, we hear the word of God from outside of ourselves, the living word in the written word outside of ourselves, extra Um And so that's where the Decalogue comes in. There is more ethical material than um, 
than the Decalogue in biblical ethics, obviously, but it is the core of ethics, I think, in both the Old Testament, in uh, the Pentateuch and the Prophets, um, and in the Pentateuch where the, uh, the, the Decalogue is actually expounded, and the Prophets where it is preached, and then in the New Testament also. I've chosen to organize all of the ethical issues covered in my book, all of the ethical issues that a pastor or Christians may encounter, by organizing them actually under the rubric of the Ten Commandments. Each commandment is considered in both its negative and its positive statements throughout the Bible uh, without any revisionism. This is the method of synecdoche employed by John Calvin. For example, he would say that the command, thou shalt not murder, stated in the negative, has as its positive, do what gives life to people, and so on. The method of considering all ethical issues under a commandment I actually borrowed from a former professor here at Regent, a professor of ethics, Klaus Bachmuehl, who said not only that, that there is no new ethical material in the New Testament, uh, but that the commandments are like area codes. Um, unlike Klaus, I actually managed to finish looking at all 10 because I was writing a book. Uh, he was sometimes accused of teaching a course on the Six Commandments because he never got past the Six during the course. Of course, he'd given such wonderful teaching that it was easy to apply the Seventh to the Ten Commandments uh, uh, from there. Tonight, I won't give concrete examples of these ethical issues described under the rubric of the Ten Commandments because I want you to buy this book. And I, I obviously, and I can't just do justice to any of them in this talk. But if you're working through any of the challenging issues of our time as a church or as a person, I hope this book can help you, uh, whether it be issues of poverty and how to help the poor, the duty of the church to care for the marginalized and the voiceless, um, that you will find some things in the book with, that may help you with that. I issues also re regarding sexuality, which of course are rife in our time. Issues like same-sex attraction and the same-sex sex act and the, dis the, the d distinction between them. Gender dysphoria. I actually prefer the word sexness to gender. Gender is very much uh, a Gnostic concept of what I feel and think rather than what my body tells me. And, and it's a re fairly recent word in human history. So our, our dysphoria with respect to our sex, um, issues like transsexuality, um, what it means to be welcoming of persons, but non-affirming of lifestyles that are contrary to the gospel. Um, all of this in light of the meaning of sex as determined by who we are in light of who God is. The nature of God as differentiated persons in unity and equality is, I believe, mirrored in the sexual differentiation of human persons. All kinds of brokenness, of course, exist around this and they require gospel grace and proper ethical response. But their prohibitions around sex find their rationale ultimately in who God is as persons in communion. In the midst of preparing this talk, I received an email from Neil and Lucy Rogers, who are pastors in Eastern Europe, and they shared with me a little clip uh, from a book, a little section from a book by Jack Wald uh, in his A Guide to International Church Ministry, Pastoring a Parade. This is the quote from page 69. Visitors to our church admire the way we relate across these lines. I've noticed that this is especially true of those who come from mainland denominations where the Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit seems to have been replaced by the Trinity of diversity, tolerance, and inclusion. My contention, he continues, and the experience in our church here in Rabat is that when we focus on the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we become more inclusive and more diverse. God so loved the world, John wrote in his gospel. The church, um, I, I, I would agree, ex, ex, except to add that, of course, the gospel of the triune God of grace does involve ethics. It involves love, but it invites people into discipleship towards change. Um, and that's true for all of us. Um, it is... Uh, terribly sad that the church has often allowed itself to be a proponent of things that are not of the gospel, not of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, for example, proponents of racism and nationalism 
even in our own country, Canada, as well as famously in South Africa. If the church had only lived by the gospel, which declares that all humans are equal in light of the image of God in every person, and that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile, it would never have made those tragic mistakes. The church, folks, is meant to be the harbinger of the new humanity and therefore a community of hospitality, yes, bringing all people into the life of God. But bringing them into the life of God necessarily involves repentance and change for all towards holiness, including sexual holiness. Christian hospitality is not the alterity of modernity. Within modernity, alterity is unconditional acceptance of everyone and no matter where they're at. Uh, Christian hospitality invites all to the cross, to true freedom. It is unconditional, but it is not unconditioned in the sense that God invites us um, to a place uh, of holiness in every sense and into true freedom. I can assure you of this book's faithfulness to the word of God as responsibly interpreted without revisionism and according to the tradition of scholarship of the ages. I've enjoyed reading Peter Kreeft and his comments on especially sexual ethics. Catholic scholar, he says this, this viewpoint that he's representing, uh, which is the traditional viewpoint of the ages, he says, expresses simply the primeval platitudes known to all pre-modern societies, the sane, sunny country of sexual common sense by the vote of the democracy of the dead. The prevailing culture is not a reliable guide on these issues, I would add. Secular society in which, by the way, there is a God. It's the God of the individual. It's the God of the intellect. Um, without recognizing its uh, prejudices. Um, it's the illusion of unprejudiced human reason. And there, too, in secular society is not a trustworthy place for ethics. Nor are our human desire a safe guide, our human desires a safe guide for sexual ethics. I believe in our time that it's so important for the church to recognize its own enculturated state and uh, to stand for the teaching of the Word of God. Another area that I deal with in this book with regard to sex is what we do when a pastor has an extramarital affair with someone in the church. Sad statistic is that around 10% uh, will. And they often don't realize when they commit um, this immorality that it is also highly unethical since the pastor is always in a position of power. The relationship is never a 50-50 relationship. And uh, you can learn some of the ways in which the church needs to handle this. Um, and uh, with respect even to the question, should, should a pastor who has been uh, discovered in such an act and, uh, and been disciplined ever return to the pulpit. And I like the words of Stuart Bisco, who recently passed away, who once said that a pastor, when a, when a pastor sins in this kind of a way, we need to be swift to restore, but slow to reinstate. As in when they confess their sins, we are swift to communicate that they are forgiven. But that does not mean trust has been restored. We should be slow to reinstate in such a context. Here are some of the issues very quickly that arise in the book. Is there such a thing as a just war? Uh, what about ethics of preaching? What about guidelines for confidentiality? What does it mean for a pastor to speak in the public square? Uh, what about euthanasia or MAID as it's called in Canada, medical assistance in dying where the ethics of individualism prevails over any concept of God or community? What about issues like Sabbath? What about the relationships between church and state? All of these are, you'll find, under the appropriate area, co area codes of the Decalogue in the book. So that's the first area of, I think, Trinitarian personhood is hearing the word of Christ through the written word of God. Um, secondly, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, the development of character. And so notice, um, as in Second Peter, there is a uh, speak, there's a speech about, wonderful speech about knowing Christ that begins and ends the passage. There are um, bookends. Before Peter ever deals with the great virtues that are described in that passage, he begins with two references to the knowledge, the experiential knowledge of Christ, and then uses those wonderful words that we participate in the divine nature. That, my friends, is the key to cultivating virtue, is living into that life in God. Um, and so 
hearing the word of God from outside of ourselves. Secondly, cultivating virtue inside of ourselves, accompanied by the work of the Spirit who resides, who resides within us through communal and personal spiritual practices. Um, thirdly, however, I just want to keep the picture of the symbol of the Holy Spirit up there because there's a, a third aspect, I think, to Trinitarian ethics for a pastor. They hear the word of God from outside of themselves. They listen um, they, they are cultivating virtue from within themselves, and then they're listening for the voice of the Holy Spirit um, within themselves or above themselves, we might say. Um, as Karl Barth uh, often said, when it comes to ethical decision making, we cannot know in advance what the good or the right might be. Um, this is situational ethics, in other words, with a small s, not the capital S um, of, of Joseph Fletcher's uh, minimalized uh, ethics, uh, but rather the small s of recognizing that when we come into situ situations, they're almost always unique in some aspect, and we need to listen for a particular word of God in that situation and for the work of the Spirit who brings um, these words to us in the midst of our making uh, ethical decisions. And then third, fourthly, um, as those in covenant relationship with God, we are also in community with his people. And so we consult, consult, consult um, with the community of wisdom around us and before us. Um, we make decisions in light of what the doctors of the church have said for centuries, what the great scholars of the church have said for centuries, as well as the community around us right now dealing with contemporary issues. I think it's really important for pastors to develop a relationship with a doctor a um, medical doctor, with a psychiatrist, with a lawyer, with some, with some therapists in the area, um, because there are many things that we encounter that we don't have the answers for. And so we consult with the community of wisdom. I'll never forget as a pastor, the first time I encountered the, one of the saddest situations a couple can go through is they um, found that their baby was anencephalic, uh, which means it uh, it lacked a brain. And uh, they were wondering, they were devout people, they were wondering if they should abort or whether they should uh, bring the baby uh, to birth. And I phoned up my friend, Dr. Ivan Stewart, and he gave me good advice. He says the most healing thing to do is for the, is for the mother to actually give birth to the baby and then for the couple to hold that baby. And it usually dies within a few hours. Uh, and that therapeutically, that, that's the best way forward that also honors their conviction around abortion. So um, had I not phoned Dr. Stewart, I would have been completely lost. And there are a number of other situations in which I've had to call doctors uh, to gain some advice. So anyway, having tantalized you with what is in the book concretely, uh, but not told you much about that, and I want, to, I want, not, want now for the bulk of the rest of this talk to go back to the foundations or meta-ethics, which is the Trinitarian ethics uh, which I believe to be the ground for character building, the ground for virtue ethics, and the ground for ethical decision making, and the ground for uh, speaking in the public square. I believe the most significant question of our time as theologians is this, what does it mean to be human? And specifically, what does it mean to be a human person? This is the core question from which I think we must address all issues of sexuality, character, uh, race, and so on. While spiritual formation and spirituality are important, they've become somewhat buzzwords, I think, in the current Christian culture. Um, I, I, I want to say, however, that spiritual formation in Christ is really important. But I also want to say it is a consequence explicitly of union and communion with Christ, or participation in Christ, or participation in the life of God in Christ by the Holy Spirit. Spiritual formation is transformation into the imago Dei as seen in Christ, that is the image of God. It is participatory at its core. It is Trinitarian in its context. Um, as, as Tom Smale um, Scottish theologian once wrote, he said, in Christ, the human mirror, he was talking about the fact that the image of God involves us having a mirror that reflects back on God. The mirror has been distorted by our sin. But he says, in, the, in Christ, the human mirror is converted back to God, redirected and refocused on its original, its divine original, and becomes transforming to those who enter into the 
the union with Christ that is effected through our submission to him in faith and that brings us into the beginnings of a human life that reflects the life of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in their distinctiveness and in their union of love. I'm going to circle back to the relationship between persons and character in the context of 2 Peter 1 just a little in a little while. But before going there, I want to do a little theological revision on the matter of personhood, seeking to emphasize it as a primary category for theological anthropology. And then I will share a little of my own personal narrative around personhood, character, and ethics. So the first major point uh, of our of our uh, of our uh, talk is personhood in light of the Trinity and in light of the Imago Dei and in light of Christ. First of all, personhood in light of the Trinity. You know, trying to know yourself is not easy. Alan Watts once said that trying to define yourself is like trying to bite your own teeth. Um, in a Crux article in 2021, Lauren Wilkinson uh, one of our professors, uh, Emeriti, says, sadly, we find ourselves in a state of human-caused climate change, which, he says, is partly the result of more and more people in the world trying to define themselves as consuming selves. Self-knowledge is important, but ironically, it is discovered in the knowledge of God's self. It does not come about by means of the self-obsession of this age, where everybody takes selfies all the time, it seems. In that article, Lauren points to the thought of the 19th century Jesuit poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, which he says connects our own selfhood back to the self-giving love of the triune creator. And this gives us deep insight into the nature of the cosmos and then how we are called to be present in it as persons in relation, reflecting the divine persons in relation. The crucial question then is this, what does it mean to be a human person in light of the fact that we've been created in the image of a triune God who is, according to the full divine revelation, three persons of irreducible identity in a oneness of essence and a oneness of communion? That is, three persons in relation. Specifically, we are probing the possibility of a relationship, which I want to say very quickly is an analogous relationship. It's not a univocal one between divine and human personhood. But by that I mean um, it is analogous in the sense that our personhood is derived from God's personhood, but his personhood is divine and transcendent. And each of the persons of the Trinity, each is completely in the other. They are mutually internal to one another, whereas the most that we can accomplish as human persons is to be mutually interdependent to one another. Um, so there's an analogy, but there isn't a university about divine and human personhood is the point I want to make. And, um, and so I, I want to say, however, there is an analogous relationship. And ultimately, that analogy is the person of Jesus Christ, as we'll see in just a moment. Because some might object and say, look, isn't the imminent trinity in particular, isn't the imminent trinity opaque to us? And I believe to say such a statement is to nullify the revelation of God given to us in Jesus Christ. The imminent trinity is illuminated by the economic trinity, which is the revelation to us of God uh, in the person of Jesus Christ. We have seen here on earth how father and son interact with one another. Their relationship to one another here on earth has a correspondence to their relationship with one another throughout eternity. The divine processions give way to the divine missions. Uh, Karl Barth made a, an important statement when he says uh, that imminent trinity and economic trinity are, they're not identical, um, as some theologians have tried to say, such as Moltmann and Karl Rahner, but rather, he says, very importantly, they must be correspondent, because if they're not, what God has revealed of himself to us here in the person of Jesus Christ by the Spirit, therefore, if it has no correspondence with who God really is, we are back on our quest looking for God. God has proved himself to be in some way lacking in integrity if who he is here on earth is not who he is um, in heaven. So um, a quick refresher on the doctrine of the Trinity I think is important here. There has been a great renaissance in Trinitarian theology since Karl Barth. At one level, 
there was a great consensus around the Nicene and Athanasius creeds. So that all Orthodox theologians, by Orthodox, I mean small o Orthodox in this context, can actually give assent to the formula one God and three persons, or a God who is one in essence, that is uh, usia, um, one in communion, and three in persons, in person, hypostasis. There have, however, been some controversies in the, in the tradition lately between around unity and plurality. So-called classical Trinitarians are more comfortable with the term relations, using that term relations instead of persons. And uh, these are, of course, uncomfortable also making even an analogy between divine and human persons. And then there are social Trinitarians, um, some of whom I think impose sociological agendas onto the Trinity, but there are also other social Trinitarians who follow the tradition closely and particularly the Cappadocian tradition, and are comfortable with the term persons as long as we understand them to mean persons who are persons in relation, each in the other, persons who are mutually internal to one another, not individuals, not tritheism here, but tr trinity, persons who are indivisible with respect to their being and their acts, yet who by the doctrine of appropriations are spoken of also with specificity regarding their acts. For example, it is the Son alone who becomes incarnate and dies on the cross, yet he is not alone, as the Father and the Spirit are always with him, according to the doctrine of the indivisibility of the persons. This traditioned version of the social trinity should, in my mind, be called the classical view, because it was, it was that of the Cappadocian fathers. It should be emphasized that these theologians do not think of the relation between divine and human persons as univocal but they do understand that the fully mutually internal nature of the divine persons mm -hmm. is to be our goal in light of the image of God and our eschatological destiny. They know that whilst divine persons are mutually internal to one another, we can only ever be mutually interdependent. Thus, it is quite consistent with the theology of the Cappadocian fathers to say that divine persons are persons in relation. That is, they are, as Miroslav Wolf has helpfully said, persons who are mutually internal to one another, persons whose differentiation is compatible with and received within that mutuality, persons with irreducible identity, but persons who have non-subscribability. That is, each is each, yet each is in the other, both with respect to being and to act. Of course, we do know that all illustrations of the Trinity are sadly heretical. We use them to help our children understand the doctrine of the Trinity, but most of them are either tritheistic or modalistic. But by way of analogous illustration is Einstein's observation that at the core level of matter, so the core level of what the, of, of substances, of, 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 of what matter is, there are quantum particles which exhibit a quantum entanglement effect. Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen pointed out that according to this effect, if the position of the first particle were measured, the result of, the, of, the result of measuring the position of the second particle could be predicted. If instead the momentum of the first particle were measured, then the result of measuring the momentum of the second particle could be predicted. They retain the memory of their interactions with each other. That is, these quantum particles maintain their own integrity, but were at the same time non-circumscribable, non-circumscribable. They were, in that sense, relational. Each is each, but each is in the other. Humans, even more so, at a higher level of reality, if you think, are, have a correspondence also with the divine being. That is, by analogy, we are persons of irreducible identity, but we are also persons in relation with God and the human other, just as the triune God is persons of irreducible identity uh, in relation. Now, discussions like these um, make it not unsurprising that someone, the great Catholic scholar Hans Urs von Balthasar, asserted that the truth concerning the Trinity can only be developed in two opposite lines of being and thought that point to each other. For me, the most, the most helpful statements around um, the Trinity and our relation to it are the words of Jeremy Begbie, Scottish theologian teaching at Duke, 
who said, what could be more apt than to speak of the Trinity as a three-note chord, a resonance of life, Father, Son, and Spirit mutually indwelling without mutual exclusion and yet without merger, each occupying the same space, sounding through one another, yet irreducibly distinct, reciprocally enhancing and establishing one another um, as other. That's a lovely statement that describes, um, helps us describe divine personhood and therefore also human person by way of analogy. Another way to say this is that to deny uh, an analogous relationship between divine and human persons is to ignore two great revelational realities. One, that humans are made in the image of God, and two, that the bridge between divine and human personhood is um, is in fact the, uh, the the bridge between divine and human personhood is in fact the divine second person of the Trinity, who as divine person took on human nature, thus constituting a divine human single person. Um, let's explore the image of God uh, very briefly first. Uh, and I'm going to go rather fast here. You'll find this all in the book. There is a, this is a mystery, and there's a mystery and grandeur about God that humans cannot ever emulate. The divine persons are mutually internal, and we are only ever interdependent. God will always be God, and we, although wonderfully embraced into the love of the triune God by the gospel and made one with Christ, will always stay human. On the other hand, the existence of some form of analogy is strongly suggested by the fact that we're made in the image of God. Let me just read very briefly by way of reminder, Genesis 1.26, which says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and over the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. Um, he created, created he them. So let me first of all speak about personhood in light of the image of God. The image of God concept can be quite tricky. Very grateful to Krista McCurland. When I heard her lecture at St. Andrews a number of years ago, she's a PhD student at the time, and she commented on the fact that we must speak of the, the image of God in two, two different ways. First of all, there is a non-degreed sense of the image of God. So the image of God involves rationality. It involves function, work, and so on. It involves relationality. And there is a non-degreed nature to that. That is that all human beings have that. Um, as long as they're human beings, they are uh, made in the image of God. And we are to we are to treat them um, as, as such. Um, so that, that's the non-degree. Actually, the whole basis for human rights historically in the Western world has come precisely from this concept of non-degree human rights. Many Western countries don't realize that their doctrine of human rights on which they are so insistent are actually um, spoken of as if on borrowed capital, which comes from the Christian faith. Yet there is a degree nature to the, um, the image of God. When people, so the non degree nature of the image of God, just a moment, uh, Genesis chapter 9 speaks about people who have already, already fallen into sin and they are still in the image of God. There's some aspect of the image of God that, they, that all human beings have, and that's the basis of human rights. What is the, exactly the nature of, however, the image of God in us? And as I just said a moment ago, there's an ontological nature which has to do with our reason, our capacity for self-reflection, our conscience, um, our volition. All of those things are part of the image of God. There's also a functional nature to the Im image of God, which involves um, our work and our, our function in uh, both as singles in community and as people who are married in families. But primarily and essentially, as to me is very evident from what we've just read in Genesis 1, the image of God is about being relational and our being persons in relation in uh, particular. Uh, one of my former master's students, Jeremy Kidwell, wrote a great sentence in his 
master's thesis when he commented that appreciation for the polyvalence of the doctrine of the image of God allows for a composite meaning. In other words, we must take all three things into consideration, which is so right. But I have to say that I'm convinced that it is the relational aspect which is undoubtedly the controlling definition of the image of God. Um, Tom Torrance, um, also a Scottish theologian, interestingly notes that, uh, noted rather, he's passed away now, noted that God is the primary actor when it comes to human beings bearing his image. He writes this, it is fundamentally God who does the beholding of the image. He images himself in humanity. That's from his uh, Calvin's Doctrine of Man, page 42. Now, how that relationality of persons in relation is manifest in humans is first of all, with respect to their relationship with the God who is imaging himself in them, and then their relationship with each other, which is characterized primarily in Genesis 1 by their being sexed, that is, being male or female. Um, male and female created he them. So this is the binary of male and female, which echoes both the differentiation and equality in the persons of the Godhead. So the primary meaning that cannot be ignored is that humans, like God, are relational, and specifically are persons in relation who relate to one another as sexed people. Um, there is no mention of the sex act in Genesis 1, only in Genesis 2, which references it within marriage between a man and a woman only. In Genesis 1, the sexedness of all humans is what is being referred to, meaning emphasizing sex as that a force which drives us out of ourselves towards God and out of ourselves towards one another in community, in community and in contemplation. Uh, this puts the sex drive in its appropriate context. And it's the source of our healing for uh, many of our sexual challenges. When we find ourselves uh, so when we satisfy ourselves in the depth of the love and character of God as persons, we are able to manage uh, those drives. Um, but if this does not convince you that human persons as persons are an image of the divine ones, let me move quickly then to Christology. How do we bridge the divine human divide without confusing God and humanity? The most important bridging concept is indeed a bridging person, capital P. We affirm with Alan Torrance what I think is some of the most important words ever written in Christian theology, the radical and dynamic continuity between the divine and the human that is the event of Christ, of Jesus Christ. Thus, emphatically, the, the analogy is grounded not in university, but in Christ by way of the Bonifierian Bartian analogia relationis. Um, Oliver Donovan um, comments wonderfully on the Christological grounding of the analogy between divine and human persons. He says on the basis of the Chalcedonic affirmation that Christ is one person in two natures in which person is hypostasis, is the non-generic principle of individual existence and which nature refers to the complex of attributes which describe the generic distinctness of divinity and humanity. He affirms that through the influence of Bethius's fifth tractate, this conception of person became generalized from the unique person of Christ to all persons. The human individual is thus not merely a concretization of his human attributes, but a bearer of them, and as such is not merely a chip off the old block of total humanity, but someone who is human. This is remarkable. Um, every one of us is a miracle. We are not just a chip off the old block of generic humanity. We are unique persons, some per someone who is human. Whether we are male or female, bond or free, Jew or Gentile, we are someone who is human. And um, that miraculous nature of personhood, which reflects the miraculous nature of the person within the Trinity and the bridging person of Christ himself, um, I say this with all the conviction of my heart. This is crucial to an understanding of human personhood. Andrew Caitler, professor at Catholic Pacific College and Trinity Western, in, in his introduction to his recent book, The Eschatological Person, Alexander Schmiemann and Joseph Ratzinger, in dialogue, he comments beautifully that both Alexander Schmiemann and Joseph Ratzinger insist that the human person remains shrouded in mystery without God's self-disclosure in the person of Jesus Christ. 
it couldn't be said more clearly. Um, uh, in Alexander Schmiemann, in particular, Eastern Orthodox theologian says, in the Christian teaching, man is always a person, and thus not only a microcosm reflecting the whole world, but also a unique bearer of its destiny and a potential king of creation. The whole world is given in a unique way to each person, and thus in each person it is saved or perishes. There's a strong word about personhood and its uniqueness, but also our responsibility in light of the image of God to care for God's creation um, to help save it, uh, in other words. Um, So in Chalcedonian Christology, there is no human person already existing that the Son of God becomes one with at the Incarnation. The eternal Logos is a person, and over against the adoptionist heresy, the Logos, Logos does not at the moment of Incarnation take on another already existent human person who is adopted into union with the Logos, thus making this a two-person union as in Nestorianism. Rather, their, uh, their Chalcedonian Christology has a, as its background and context the theology of the Trinity, such that the hypostatic union will be determined by the pre-existence of the person, hypostasis, of the Son, who is God. So the doctrine of the two natures of Christ in one person is, in that sense, asymmetric. It is a divine person taking on a human person and not the other way around. Christ is therefore one person, that of the Son, who has by his union instantiated one person who is both fully divine and fully human without confusion. That is, therefore, a result of that, there is a correspondence between personhood in God and the prototypical human Jesus, and therefore us. Now, let us bring that, into bear, bear, bring that to bear upon our discussion of theological anthropology and to ethics in particular, in light of the theological thickness of the term person in God and in Christ and in us, in light of these Trinitarian Christological grounds, let us come to personhood in light of um, personhood as a, as a primary theological category. I contend that union of persons with Christ, their being in Christ, which is the most important prepositional phrase of the New Testament, or participation in his life is actually the key to character formation and transformation. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced that participation in the history of Jesus Christ, sometimes called Ordo Historia, becomes the Ordo Salutis, that is the order of salvation for us. And that is the primary language of the New Testament. When it comes to formation and transformation and that, and that virtue, um, and, that, and that virtue is a subset or consequence of that. Um, the focus on virtue is a circle within the larger circle of life and God, in other words. Virtues are really important, but they are a product of engraced participation in Christ. And it seems to me that certain theological ethicists in our time are more enamored of Aristotle than they are of Jesus. And that's why we have such a prominence of virtue ethics over participational Trinitarian ethics. This means that Trinitarian ethics, the ethics of persons in communion, is the broadest category within which virtue ethics and deontological and consequentialist ethics must be considered. Um, and I've written a lot more about that in the book. Let me come to point number three, um, which is personhood as the locus of the fall and its recovery. Um, so how are we as persons individuated? And uh, just very quickly, I think we're individuated by our DNA. Each person has a unique DNA. We have a uniqueness to our physicality. Um, and therefore, we have a uniqueness to our personality and character. Um, you know, it's true that Sean Connery may have a double, but none of us actually have a double. We are all utterly unique. Uh, when we see a new baby, we always look for the traits of the parents and the grandparents. Of course, they are there as a result of DNA. And we sometimes say, oh, that person's uh, papa's double. But we know there's a fundamental uniqueness to every human person. Even twins who may have identical uh, genetics have their unique personality formed by the relations with their parents. Uh, 
or they have very similar DNA, shall we say, and they they are uh, they have a they nevertheless differ in their personality and their relations. And thirdly, our personal histories are also unique. None of us has the same personal history. This is part of the wonder of Christian personhood, I think. So what went wrong? Uh, the fall happened is what went wrong. And as a result of that, um, there has been all kinds of uh, distortion around our personality and character. Our persons become alienated from one another or characterized by distance as opposed to intimacy. We are alienated from God and require reconciliation. And our personal histories become filled with things like trauma. Um, we are all, in some sense, recovering from imperfect parents, the irony of which is we become imperfect parents ourselves. Um, so clearly, these are the things that have uh, gone wrong. Um, Athanasius puts it very wonderfully, the, uh, uh, the great father from Egypt who, who in, my, in my books is perhaps the greatest theologian of all time, who commented on the fact that the fall consisted on the withdrawal of the first humans from God. They were given the gift, the gift of being, the gift of intellect, the gift of being able to participate in God, and they withdrew. And then he moves on to talk about the last Adam and the fact that the last Adam is the one who doesn't withdraw from the presence of God. And in fact, he... Um, goes all the way to the cross and offers himself up to God um, in a way that helps us be, uh, be re restored and reconciled to God. Anatolius, uh, Orthodox scholar with res respect to Athanasius' work, said that our inclusion into Christ's death of self-offering also brings about the renewal of our participation in divine life, which is his resurrection. And so um, the, the road back is um, towards participation with God and finding ourselves um, all, all over again, if, if, you, if you like, in light of what God's estimate is of us, in light of who Christ is, uh, is, is for us. I, I like to think that there's a lovely Trinitarian recovery for self-worth, which many of us struggle with, and our self-hatred. And number, to know this, that we have a Father who planned our lives, who elected us, before the foundation of the world. We have a son who has thought so much of us that he went to the cross to redeem us and to reconcile us. We have a spirit who indwells us and is the very gift of God to us and who gives us gifts in a, in a turn. How can we not value ourselves appropriately in, in light of that? Despite all of that, some of us are in a lifelong process of recovery. I, and I think sometimes we deeply confuse self-hatred with hatred of sin. We are to hate our orientation towards sin. We are to hate the fact that we are, instead of being um, ex curvatus ex se, orientated towards the other, we become in curvatus in se. We are curved in and ourselves, obsessed with ourselves, and yet ironically in hatred of ourselves. The answer is not self-hatred, it is hatred of sin. But as Henry Nouwen said very beautifully, self-rejection is, is the greatest enemy of the spiritual life because it contradicts the sacred voice that God calls us God's beloved. How do I discern the voice that says, be humble from the one that says you're nothing? Humility has nothing to do with self-rejection. You can only be humble if you have a deep self-respect. Self-rejection cannot form the basis uh, of a humble life. It leads only to complaints, jealousy, anger, and even violence. Those are beautiful words. We need to learn to love, to receive the love of God in order to go through healing. Some of the ways in which we go through that we manifest our self-hatred is busyness and drivenness and avoidance of relational intimacy. Um, C.F. Lewis again said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. That only comes about with a focus on God, the divine other, and on humans, um, our, uh, our human others. Uh, we think thinking less of ourselves. I'm often struck with the fact that in John 13, 
where Jesus washes his disciples' feet and where conspicuously they don't wash anybody's feet, that Jesus knows who he is. It says just before he did that great act, knowing that he come from the Father and was going to the Father, it's in full possession. He's got nothing to prove, and therefore he is free to serve. And uh, the disciples have too much to prove. Darlene Fozard Weaver once said that the right, the right self-love designates a morally proper form of self-relation characterized by the moral norms of love for God and love of neighbor. So we've looked at personhood in light of the Trinity and the Imago Dei in Christ, in light of the Trinity, in light of the Imago, in light of Christology. In other words, we've looked at personhood as the primary theoanthropological category, personhood as the locus of the fall. And now I want to just very briefly look at this passage to see how personhood and character relate to one another. In other words, it's as we are persons in the love of God, loving God and loving neighbor, that character becomes inevitable and ethical decision making will take its place under the leading and constant guidance of the Holy Spirit. But persons come first in this great passage. Um, so, for example, we find um, it, it, two references, which I noted earlier, verse three. His divine power has given us all things, all that we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him. Actually, he speaks twice in two verses about the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, our, our knowledge of the triune God, in other words. We've been given grace. We've been brought into faith um, by grace through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, the whole context is who God is for us who Christ is for us, and our knowledge of God. And then the very core of this passage is verse 4, that as a result of the great and precious promises of the gospel that bring us into knowledge of God, we participate in the divine nature. By the way, that word participate is a simple word in Greek, koinonia, simple but profound word. It's not the Greek word methexis, uh, which sometimes carries with it the connotation of the loss of clarity between divine and human persons. Koinonia is the word here. Uh, in which we are brought into the fellowship of the triune God. We don't become God, we become like God, and we participate in the persons of the Trinity as human persons through Christ. This is the heart, I think, of the great, this great passage. And then in light of that, uh, Peter uses the weight of everything he said uh, by using these words for this very reason. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and so on, all of the, the great virtues, which culminate, of course, in the greatest of all virtues, which is love, and verse 7, and then he repeats this concept of the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then he moves on to speaking about how we cultivate uh, the relationship with Christ, and how we cultivate uh, these virtues, and he uses the word make every effort. Actually, the words make every effort are twice in this context, uh, so it's not as if um, God does everything. I mean, he does do everything, but we also do everything. In other words, um, Christian sanctification is not passivity. It's activity in his activity. It's human agency within divine agency. Um, just God has done everything for us, given us the capacity for participation in the divine nature, but we are still to work out our salvation because he is at work in us. Um, and this is the great work of the, the, the spiritual disciplines, the spiritual disciplines which are both uh, communal and which are personal. One of the concerns I have about um, one of the concerns I have about pastors in particular is that often they don't take part in what are the greatest disciplines of the church, which are the ecclesial disciplines. So yes, they preach every Sunday. And yes, they do communion every Sunday or the sacraments, but they themselves are often preoccupied with doing all that and they don't drink in. And as a result, their lives can, can uh, dry up and they're very prone then um, to ethical failure. So uh, let me encourage you pastors out there to be people who engage in communal disciplines. Go somewhere else once a week to hear somebody else preach. I mean, the business of preaching yourself is sanctifying. Don't get me wrong, particularly if you are... Uh, into the word and you're exegeting the word in my opinion that is the only kind of preaching there is is exegetical preaching um exegesis itself is the word of god 
And as you preach that word, you are sanctified by it. Um, and if Karl Barth is correct, the words of man or woman as they preach become the words of God in the power of the Spirit. And that, that is a sanctifying experience. But nevertheless, um, we all need to... Um, we all need to take in preaching. Dallas Willard said, grace is never opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. Earning is an attitude. Effort is an action. And one of the things I think we need to do is, is, is uh, hear the word of God from outside of ourselves. Um, Hans Horst and Balthasar talks to both Catholics and Protestants in this great little um, paragraph here. He says, in the Eucharist and in all the church's sacraments and in the church as a whole seen as sacrament, we are incorporated into the incarnate word at the level of being. Isn't that beautiful? So that's the, when you take the Lord's Supper, you're, you're reincorporated, as it were, uh, into the very being of Christ, uh, who, uh, at least in a reformed way, think about the Eucharist, Christ comes down to us by the Spirit, and he, and, he, and he unites us afresh with himself, and we feed on him in the bread and wine, and then we are carried up in the ascension, uh, in, 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 into the ascended Christ afresh. Um, I love those words. He is our milieu, the medium in which we live. It is so close to us in silent intimacy that it goes unnoticed, but we encounter it in its sovereign personal freedom and spiritual character in the express word of scripture, preaching and church and church teaching, and above all in contemplation. Um, he makes the comment that Catholics need to hear the word of God more because they're very focused on the Eucharist and that Protestants, we need to focus more on the Eucharist. Uh, because we hear lots of the word of God, and in order to be balanced Christians. Uh, so our disciplines are communal, uh, first and foremost. Um, it is uh, Jeremy Taylor, who was one of the great Anglican divines, comments on why it's important to hear the word of God. My point here, folks, is that, you know, you expect me to speak about the spiritual disciplines of solitude, silence, and um, indeed, they're important. Dallas Willard organized them according to um, the death and resurrection of Christ, disciplines of negation, disciplines of uh, engagement. Um, and those are important. Don't get me wrong. We do need to be into the word ourselves as persons and so on. But I think the most important aspect of spiritual disciplines that are really receptacles of grace for participating in the life of God um, I love what Jeremy Taylor said. He comments on the attendance at, at temple worship by Mary and Joseph with Jesus. And he says this, that in public solemnities, God opens his treasures and pours out his grace more abundantly. Private devotions and secret offices of religion are like refreshing of a garden with the distilling and petty drops of a water pot. But addresses to the temple and serving God in the public communion of the saints is like rain from heaven. For religion is a public virtue, it is the ligature uh, of souls. Here are the disciplines I was referring to a moment ago. Um, I want to end by uh, simply sharing a story of my own uh, journey, struggling with a poor sense of self and accompanying with that uh, clinical depression, which I've struggled with most of my life. I had the first encounter when I was in my early 30s. Um, and um, went through a lot of healing. I needed to go for uh, psychiatric care and for medication and grateful for these things, which are a means of God's grace, I believe, to us um, when used appropriately. And I'll never forget, in the midst of the darkest time of that depression, my wife got, my wife Sharon became ill with hepatitis A, and so I was holding down my job as a pastor. I didn't let anybody know I was struggling with depression. And, um, and so I, uh, I had preached on this particular Sunday. And Monday, um, preachers know about Mondays after Sundays, the shut off of our adrenaline and a tendency to go even deeper into depression. Uh, I was looking after the kids all day, got them to school, gave them their meals, um, was pretty exhausted. Uh, Sharon at that time couldn't even get out of bed. Uh, she was a wonderful uh, 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 home worker. She just loved loved that kind of thing. And here was I trying to keep up with her. And um, it came in the evening, we needed groceries. And so I ran off, got in the car and ran off to the uh, store to try and get groceries. I'd been working on, in my spirit and a lot of the, the pain from early childhood, boarding school, all of those things. 
um, and my relationship with my father, et cetera, et cetera. And I, um, there was a fair bit of anger in my spirit, I'll say that at that time, as well as lots of pain. But I hadn't really come in touch with the pain too much. And here I was, so I'm on this way to the groceries. Every single one of the traffic lights took far too long to turn. I got to the grocery store, got my groceries, and the, the, the lineup was long, long queue in order to get my groceries. And I was thinking to myself, this, this lady doesn't know what she's doing. And <laughs> I was not in a very good space. I finally got the groceries into the car, slammed the, 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 the boot shut, and climbed into the car. And I noticed that next to me was a, a cassette tape of worship music. And I say to my shame, I looked at it and I said, the last thing I want to hear right now is any Christian music. However, um, I suppose it was, must have been the Holy Spirit who caused me to put this tape into the tape deck. This is how long ago it is. This is, this is cassette tapes and tape decks. I, and all of a sudden, the words of a song uh, were being sung by a, a worship leader from Gordon, Gordon College. Um, and it was so powerful. I, as, and so these were the words. Uh, loved with everlasting love. To, another bit of background, I was fastidious about reading my seven chapters a day from my Bible, and I hadn't done that that day. I hadn't even had a time with God that day, so I seemed very guilty about that too. So here's what I read, and this uh, wonderful um, pastor was, uh, was singing, and this is what he said, saying, love with everlasting love, led by grace that love to know, Spirit breathing from above, thou hast taught me it is so. Oh, what full and perfect peace. Oh, what transport all divine in a love which cannot cease. I am his and he is mine. And I began to feel the love of God. Maybe I felt a little bit of it before I believed it was in my head. But all of a sudden, the love of God, the love of the triune God, God began to bathe my soul. I did a head-to-heart journey and I began to actually weep. I hadn't wept once as an adult and here i was weeping with the sense of the love of god being poured over me um, the last verse says oh let me read the third verse things that once were wild alarms cannot now disturb my rest closed in everlasting arms pillowed on the loving breast god used this to heal my sense of aloneness uh, that i'd experienced as a child of six away from my parents for eight months of the year Oh, to lie forever here, doubt and care and self-resign while he whispers in my ear, I am his and he is mine. His forever, only his, who the Lord and me shall part. Ah, with what a rest of bliss Christ can fill the loving heart. Heaven and earth may fade and flee, firstborn light and gloom decline, but while God and I shall be, I am his and he is mine. I found myself in that cradle of the love of God and hearing him saying, look, I'm yours and you're mine, and that's forever. And even all the times that you've been through as a child, away from home, I was there. I was holding you, and I've been holding you ever since. And that, my friends, okay, we can't, we can't rely on experiences like this all the time. I realize that. When they come, we value them. We cherish them. But most of the time, it's the nitty gritty of reading the word and praying and listening for God's voice uh, through the spirit, through other people and so on. Um, it's a combination of those things. But it's that, it's out of that relationship, that relationality with Christ, with the, the loving triune God of grace. When we are fresh with him, uh, that is the way in which our character is transformed. It's the way in which we make wise ethical decisions uh, for his glory. And we speak in the public square in ways that are helpful uh, to the world, not legally, but evangelically, graciously, um, and, and not using political power. Uh, this is the word of God. I pray this book will be a blessing to each of you. And may you be encouraged in Christ. Uh, may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you. Uh, let me say on behalf of all of us, and the applause indicates that just how grateful we are for a really stimulating address and challenging, as always, from you, and, and also what you've personally shared, the sense of self and uh, even the struggle with depression. 
Those of you who haven't been around Regent in recent years know that Ross has shared his story around some of these mental health challenges very openly and candidly and very, very helpfully for many of us in this community. So thank you very much for again doing that and weaving that into this story. So you folks, it's a chance for questions, responses, comments perhaps. There's two microphones on each aisle. Let me start with one, Ross, which is, which is I'll take you into the book. Mm -hmm. the, um, I'm intrigued very much by the structure of organizing so many issues and challenges and questions around the Ten Commandments. I too was a student of Klaus Bachmuehl. In, in the course on Christian ethics, I only got to the Sixth Commandment with Klaus, <laughs> too, like, just like you were saying. Um, what I wonder about is, uh, as you are working through the commandments and, and in light of all these issues that we're facing in the world today, which, which issue uh, proved to be the gnarliest one for you? Which one did you have to stop and really wrestle with and scratch your head and, and wonder whether you were getting it right? Do you mean struggling with fitting it into one of the commandments? No, or just which one that was out there that you wanted to address you knew was a big issue that you felt like had to be in the book, no matter what commandment it's under. Um, yeah. What were you wrestling with the most? So under, the, under a commandment that relates to speaking, I spoke about um, how pastors should speak in the public square, or not speak in the public square, depending. I think that is one of the most difficult challenges we face because on the one hand, we're not looking for Constantine uh, to, to reign again. We're not looking for a so-called Christian country. Um, and some people react to that by going to sort of the opposite extreme and saying, well, let's just be the community of Christ um, and that hope somehow that that will spill over. And I'm somewhere in the middle and I think articulating that was challenging. In other words, I think when Jesus says that you're meant to be salt and light, it's a preserving thing. And so I do think that the Christian church does need to speak. Pastors do need to speak in the public square. They need to do so graciously, evangelically, not legally. Uh, sometimes when we speak, all people hear is condemnation. Uh, we need to offer alternatives. And we, I think it's the manner of speaking that's so important. Uh, so, I mean, we have examples to the south of us where um, it's... It's, uh, you know, I think it's inappropriate in many ways because I think there's the assumption that this is a Christian country and that, and that the church starts to throw its weight around in ways that I think are contrary to the character of Jesus. That's not the way he functioned. Um, so finding my way through that issue, I, I, I think I found my way to a reasonable solution for me. Um, and so you got Stanley Harawas over here and you have sort of the, the far right over here. And I found somebody like Alan Torrance, actually, surprisingly, perhaps, uh, in terms of people not being aware that he speaks a lot about this, um, his, his idea says, yes, the church is all important, but the church, just like the Trinity, is a communion in ecstasis. It's a communion that is meant to spill over, not just because you hope people will see you worshiping or whatever, but because you are a presence. The people of God are a presence. I love what Paul Stevens says in one of his books. He says, you don't have to send your people out on Sunday. They're out every Monday. What you need to do is equip them to speak Christianly about what it means to be human, what it means to be a Christian in our, in our culture and so on. Thank you. That, that is one of the toughest ones that a lot of pastors, I think, are wrestling with, that public presence and, and speech. Mm -hmm. Question up here in the aisle, John. Thanks very much, Ross. I appreciate that. I'm worried now that uh, I don't need to do a thesis on virtue and Trinitarian ethics. Um, but with that, um, one question that came up for me uh, in your discussion about mental illness um, in the context of virtue is those are two very different conversations and historically there's been some concerning overlap where um, morality is used as a, a kind of um, a shaming thing for people who, who have mental illness and, and uh, so how, how can those, what is the connection between the two if, if at all can, can morality be a guiding light, can virtue be a guiding light to help pull people out of mental illness or is that just a dangerous territory? Wow. Um, 
That's a challenging question, John. I, I, I'm not quite sure what you mean, because I'm not sure what you mean by morality. Um, are you suggesting, if you're suggesting that the first thing we do uh, when we encounter people with mental illness is address their morality, I'm not sure that's the way I would go. Sir, uh, maybe I'll rephrase yeah. that. Um, uh, mental illness is stigmatized uh -huh. morally by for, uh, for yes. many people it, so that it, it, it doesn't get treated, they don't speak up about it. Yes. Um, uh, so that suggests that there's um, yeah. really not a good relationship between those two areas, but is that redeemable in some way? Yeah, mental, um, I, I think there's a lot of improvement in the life of the church in terms of understanding mental health. So, so for example, there might have been in days gone by, if, so if you were depressed, that was maybe the result of sin, or maybe you should just pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Yeah. Those were all the measures that were taken in, uh, in days gone by. I think people have come to understand in our more scientific age that depression has a lot to do with our, the chemistry of our brain. And uh, we're still discovering that, uh, but um, you know, even, if I can say this, even Puritan pastors of the 16th century knew that if someone was depressed, they didn't condemn them, they didn't ask them to read their Bible more, didn't shame them by saying they weren't praying enough. They gathered around them, and they prayed with them and read the Bible for them, and they, they knew already about this illness in that time. And I think that the, every, I think every pastor needs an awareness of what does depression look like. What are its symptoms? How, how, are, how are its symptoms different to grief, for example? Um, and what is, what is the appropriate strategy? Pastors, for example, need to know their own echelon, as in, this is what I can do and this is what I can't do. You need to see a doctor. You need to see um, a therapist or a psychiatrist and so on. So that, those are part of, I think, of a strategy of getting away from the shaming of people from mental illness. Um, and uh, yeah, I, hopefully that's helpful. Thanks. Good, thank you, Ross. Can we go up on the other side to the microphone? Sometime. Yeah, um, so I have a question about, so you mentioned how there are pastors who fail in, uh, in their ethics in regards to like sexual abuse or power abuse or spiritual abuse. Yeah. Uh, do you think these occur because the Holy Spirit has actually left them and because like, oh, they have committed all of these uh, terrible sins against other people to their church themselves and therefore the Holy Spirit is like, oh, like, I cannot abide in this and therefore I am leaving. And the reason why I ask this question is because, you know, in the Old Testament we see that Israel continually commits these sins and then God's, and they say, oh, God's still with me. He uh, approves of this and this is completely fine, but we actually, God's like, no, this is not okay. And therefore we actually see his, temp, uh, sorry, his spirit leaving the temple. And so do you think in the same way uh, that can happen with pastors because they've committed so many uh, transgressions and sins, the Holy Spirit actually therefore leaves them? Boy, that's a difficult question. It depends on every individual situation. Yeah. Um, because, um, you know, here's the interesting thing. God uses people because they have charisms, and he uses them even when their morality is less than desired. Uh, that doesn't make it right. Um, you know, I mean, what I've tried to address in this lecture is the root of all this is personhood. It's our being persons in relation with God and with one another. That for a pastor will mean close relationship with their spouse or with friends, close relationship with God, close relationship with an accountability group. Um, accountability itself, I don't think is, um, I, have, I have a problem when we just talk about accountability because I, people can lie mm. in accountability groups, but you can't lie to people who really know you. And so the question is, do you have in your life enough people who actually know you well enough to know when you're lying and when you're bluffing and who can call you and say, look, you're still preaching okay, but I know you're not walking with God. The question of when the Holy Spirit leaves someone, I, I don't want to enter into that issue, issue. I don't know. That's, that's up to God. Um, yeah, I mean... Samson is, for me, what flashes into my mind as a person who has this great ability. But over the course of time, with his morals, the power begins to diminish. And uh, so I think that's generally what's true for people. 
People can only hide things for so long. But we in the church need to get things out from under the carpet and stop hiding them um, and help, help people to be honest in, the, in these kinds of struggles. One of the things I'd like to say also is that when a person, a pastor, falls um, morally or in whatever way they fall, especially if they fall morally, I love the statement of Stuart Briscoe, who just died, who said, in the case of leaders, you should be swift to restore them and slow to reinstate them. Right? So if they confess their sin, you hear their confession and you grant their forgiveness. But that doesn't mean to say they're in the pulpit next Sunday. It could be 10 years before they're in the pulpit. Swift to restore, slow to reinstate because trust has been violated so badly. So um, that's a general rule, I think. Thank you. Sound like wise words, Ross. Over here to this mic to David. Uh, congratulations, Professor Hastings, on this book. Yes, I'm very excited by Thank it. Thank you, I Professor took, Robinson. I took pastoral ethics with you some 15 years ago and really pleased to see this book come out. I wonder if you could speak to the pastor who has a congregation that is morally divided, where you have strong opinions on either side of an issue. And the pastor has a position um, herself, but wants to do this pastorally and wants to work with a congregation that is divided. What have you seen as um, helpful processes for shepherding a congregation through deep moral disagreements? Um, do you have any advice along those lines that you mm -hmm. might offer? Thanks, David. Um, thanks for nothing, David. <laughs> <laughs> That, that is a very tough one. I, you know, for me, it all depends on what stage we're talking about as well, David. I, I think when some of these issues arise in the life of the church, I think the pastor needs, as the person who is entrusted with the Word of God in a congregation, surely must have the freedom to give teaching uh, of an in-depth nature. Um, because if you just raise an issue in any congregation... I think you will find it largely 50-50 on some of these tougher issues that we're dealing with in our time. So um, the first thing I would want to do is to make sure, and, and, and perhaps a way to remove the pastor from the spotlight is to say, we're going to have somebody who's a very gifted theologian come and talk to this side, and then we're going to have a gifted theologian talk to this side. The pastor, however, does need to speak, I think, in the midst of that. And then... Um, Hopefully, you are in a better position to know whether people are just divided in some kind of political way or whether they're truly divided by the issue. Once the decision is made and you find yourself perhaps on the wrong side of it, that's a whole new set of, set of judgments that need to be made as to whether you should stay and pass that congregation or where with integrity you can't, you have to leave. So uh, each uh, individual pastor must make up their own mind in that regard. All right, thank you, Ross. Let's go back over to this side. Give us your name. Uh, my name's Kevin. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, I really agree with what you mentioned a moment ago about the importance of a pastor being in a community that knows them. It seems to me that there's a bit of a crisis in pastoral isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what would be your advice or counsel for churches to care well enough for their pastors so that they actually are free to be in a community that knows them well because yeah. it seems I it seems that there's a lot of pastors who long for that um, but find it quite lacking yeah that's a really great question I mean you, you hear debated all the time whether a pastor can have friends in her or his congregation and I think because they're human they can have friends how they have friends is crucial as in you know you have to have to show discretion you can't, from the pulpit, be saying, I was with my two buddies, you know, Jim and Joe, this last week. We were having a beer or whatever we were doing. Uh, everybody's going to be saying, oh, they're on the inside with the pastor. That's inappropriate. You have to be discreet. But I do think um, there is validity in having uh, close friends within your congregation and also perhaps one or two friends outside of your congregation who can also give you perspective. Uh, but... Uh, I mean, I, I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm, I struggled with this most of my pastoral life. I did have friends in congregation and outside of the congregation after a while, but it was, it was a struggle. Your kind of personality will affect this as well. If you're more introverted, you know, some of us just love to preach and then head home, you know. 
One of my professors at Dallas Seminary years ago used to say that some of our professors, they drop down out of heaven five minutes before their lecture and they go back to heaven five minutes after. And he was referring about pastors as well, uh, this, the, same, the same trend. So I think we, you know, I think it's good for us, whether we're introvert or extrovert, to push ourselves to develop these friendships. It's part of being human. Jesus had friendships. You know, on the one hand, I'm saying be careful, but on, on the other hand, don't be apologetic. Jesus had three very close friends, Peter, James, and John, who were closer to him than the other the disciples. Nobody seems to ever have quibbled about that. James and John quibble about who's going to sit at the right hand and the left hand, but they don't quibble about the fact, you know, that the, nobody quibbles about the fact that the, these three were the closest. So I think it's just part of being human. We, we gravitate towards certain people. There's chemistry. Um, Earl Palmer once said something about mentoring. Mentoring is not my favorite phrase, to be honest. But anyways, um, I think there's too much control involved in it. But he said, if there is a good mentoring relationship or a good relationship with someone, uh, chemistry is an important part of it. Because most of those friendships may not last forever. You're kind of in and then out, particularly if you move on to another church. But for the, for the duration of them, um, you know, chemistry starts a friendship. But after that, there has to be commitment. And people do really need to commit to being together and finding a place of safety. I had a small group in my last church, and it was the kind of small group where nobody cared that I was the senior pastor. And one chap would come in every, every Wednesday night, and I'd be sitting on my easy chair. He'd jump onto the chair and smother me. Um, he didn't care that I was Pastor Ross. He was a friend, a really good friend. So, yeah. Great. Thanks very much. Let's go over on this aisle. Give us your name and your question. My name is Jordan. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say thank you for the lecture, Ross, and the book. I, uh, I struggle from the ability to articulate truths about who that I am, but on the inside, I don't feel like the person that I'm describing. So I was just wondering, in locating our morality in our person in the Trinity, are there specific revelations or spiritual experiences you've had that have let the truth of who you are as a person sink deep? I didn't include this section tonight for the sake of time, but I talk, to, I talk a lot in the latter part of this talk about practices, because I think there are regular communal, regular communal and spiritual and personal practices that help us. Uh, they are not a new set of legalism. They are, I, th I, think, I think of them as pots of grace, where we participate in the life of God. Um, and um, you know, there's some good books ab about the practices. One of the things I have deep concern about for pastors is... Um, we don't experience the communal, the communal practices the way we ought to. And we are, as a result of that, um, often parched, thirst, thirsty. So, so for example, you're a pastor, you preach every Sunday, you never hear anybody else preach. You lead communion, but you're so, uh, uh, you're so sort of concentrated on make sure everything gets done right and that you don't spill the cup or you know, the bread that you, the, the reality of that moment can be missed. And one thing I think that pastors should perhaps do is go hear somebody else preach once a week and go take communion in another, another context where you really hear the words, Jordan, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. That I think over the course of time reinforces who you are. Uh, so there's communal practices and of course there are personal practices as well, silence, solitude, um, Dallas Willard organizes them according to death and resurrection of Jesus in a beautiful way uh, in, in a couple of his books. Um, Sabbath, um, hearing the word of God as you read it, and uh, Lectio Divina, all of those things. Uh, so th that's the first sort of category. I shared two experiences that I absolutely did not earn, right? They were sheer grace. And I think sometimes in the midst of our desperate places, when we've lost the sense of self, God does give those gracious visitations, um, as he did to me and um, as he's done to many others. Of course, you long for more of them. Um, I have found, in addition to the Eucharist, listening to worship music very healing as well. Um, and 
they help me to experience God, not just know about him. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Ross. I think I might uh, just take the opportunity to give one more question here. I have one more question for you. Yes. Region audience is giving you hard questions here, Ross. Yeah. So let me do another one. Else. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't expect anything else out of a region college audience. Good, good work, you guys. Um, it's to connect the Trinitarian life of participation in the Trinitarian triune life of God, that emphasis, personhood, and relationship, and transformation that comes out of that relationship with decision making. Uh, yeah. So maybe this is just a teaser for what's in the book. Yeah. We should all all get ready to buy the book. It's out there on the on the on the table. Just a minute. But I'm just wondering if you could give us a little bit of a hint of, of how you have talked about decision making. I'm just wondering about one of the things that often is, is hard to wrap your mind around is the role of the Holy Spirit, yeah. speaking of Trinitarian theology yeah. and decision making. Uh, what, would you, what would you say? What are your headlines in terms yeah. of decision making and particularly the role of the Spirit? You know, of the four things I showed that were part of a Trinitarian approach to ethics, one of them was precisely that, the spirit in ethical decision-making, yep. which is one of the reasons why I think a certain type of virtue ethics for me doesn't cut it. It's not enough that I have character. First of all, character is an outflow of participation with Christ. But, but secondly, the assumption that because I have character, I'm going to make the right decisions for me is not enough. It's too anthropocentric. Because every decision making, most decisions that I make require hearing the voice of the Spirit. Yes, researching, hear the Word of God from outside of yourself, consult, 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 but you nevertheless, at the end of the day, that's one of the reasons why I've opted for Trinitarian ethics is precisely what you just said, mm. that the Spirit of God is needed to lead us in our ethical decision making uh, every day. One of the fun things about ethics is, if you think about it, you go through ethical decisions every day of your life. You know, all kinds of ways. What food you buy, there's all kinds of things. Now, don't let that kind of rob your joy, because I kind of, you know, we can, we can think about that too much. Um, and, and uh, you know, some of the stuff is peccadillos, but uh, nevertheless, there is, uh, there is a place, there is a definite place where we need the confirmation of the Holy Spirit as we make decisions. I, I think that, and, and how do you go about that? Um, it's spiritual practices that maintain the fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life. Um, it is spiritual practices that keep you fresh with God so that in the moment um, he, he will lead you. Uh, he has promised to lead us. I mean, I, I, that gets, it gets into a whole other area. You know, some people believe that when they stand in front of their their uh, clothes cabinet in the morning that, that that's an ethical decision and they need the Holy Spirit to show them which suit to wear or which shirt to wear. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, <laughs> I think there's much more important things than that. It could be an ethical issue, I suppose, but usually not. It's, it's peccadillos. Okay, thank you for getting us started in that direction. I think up here there's one last question. We'll make this our last question and then we can um, go to the book table. Thanks. Uh, you've mentioned that um, pastors need good friends uh, to keep them um, accountable. Um, I'm just wondering, I think that presupposes that these good friends actually know how to engage in healthy conflict with the pastor. Um, and also in looking at many of the scandals in the last you know, five, ten years, um, the surprising thing is that a lot of these leaders were surrounded by uh, church councils or elders or boards of directors who actually didn't know how to engage in healthy conflict, it seems, that they only knew how to adore them as a friend. And I'm wondering if you discuss this at all in your book in terms of personhood in, in the triangle. Yeah, that's, that's an important concept. Um, I, you know, I, think, I think it is required that there be people around you who are not impressed with who you are. Um, I can only relate my own personal experience. I had a board chairman at my church, Peace Portal Alliance Church, for a number of years. Sadly, he died of cancer. Uh, Len Hordyke was, um, he had six kids, and he was one of the top CEOs in Vancouver, and led this large church, um, and was my friend. And th there are a number of ways in which he kind of answers this question. Uh, so if I called him up, you know what happens when you're in the pastorate or in any job. You, get, you encounter things and you're down about them and you're wrestling with them. 
And I would always show up at my front door and hope that my wife wouldn't notice and she'd always say, what's wrong? Because she could read me like a book. So instead of talking to her, on my way home, I'd call up Len Hordag. You know. So for example, I said to him, we were talking about one of the very most difficult decisions that involves all kinds of ethics is letting someone go on the staff. And I called him up and I was down on the mouth. <laughs> I said, I'm not sleeping at night. These were his words. Ross, get over it. That's normal when you let people go. In my life, it happens all the time. It's like, OK, thanks, Len. That really normalizes everything for me now. <laughs> um, if I was in a board meeting, and this was typical of me in a board meeting, I had five new ideas for the church. He would stop me after my first idea and in front of the whole board. He'd say, Ross, we, you gave us five new ideas last week, and we haven't uh, operationalized a single one of them. So keep the rest of your ideas until the next board meeting, board meeting if you don't mind. You know, most of us have been really hurt. I wasn't hurt because he's Len. He's my friend. I know he has my best interests at heart. So, yeah, it's required of, of us to find friends uh, like that um, who, who can speak the truth and love to you. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's iron sharpens iron, as we know. So, yeah. It's a beautiful story, Ross. Good point to end. Thank you all for being here tonight. And let's thank Ross for a wonderful evening. <laughs>